Um, I started when I was younger. I, uh, I did have some financial problems and I wanted to sort of sort that out pretty quick. Um, when I was 14, I always wanted to be a stripper. But by the time I was 18, I thought I was too fat to be a stripper. So um, I, I think that I probably wasn't in the best place when I started, but it wasn't a matter of the work where I was happy to, you know, do that. It's more to take on the sort of stigma from general society and like worrying about what everyone else will think. Like that it kind of needed to be in a more extreme place for me to be willing to take on that I thought the rest of the world was going to, you know, hate me afterwards. Um, so what was your sort of first experience of it? Was it difficult? Or? Um, I rang around a lot of places to ask all the questions because I didn't know anything at all. Um, uh, most places sort of give you the, like, the run around. They just sort of say, you know, tell you the very basics and like come in and, you know, meet the other workers and see what you think. Um, but one of the places I rang, the guy who answered was actually the boss's son. Um, and he was great. He spent 45 minutes on the phone with me. I was asking, like, what do I wear? What do I do? Like, what sort of people? The whole lot. And then he said, you know, come in and you can meet the other workers because, you know, they do the work. So they will be able to tell you more about it. So I went, my friend went shopping and got dressed and bought a G-string for the first time because I thought, like, if I'm going to be a sex worker, I'm going to need a G-string. Like, that just seems like you'd have to have one. Um, and I went along for the interview and they said, did you want to start working tonight? And I was like... Um, I think maybe I should, you know, go away and have a big thing because it seems like a really big step. And they're like, you know, well, you know, next time that the doorbell rings, you can do an intro with the rest of the workers and see how you go. So I went, all right. And I did the intro and the, the guy picked me. Um, I found out later that that was by design, that when they have um, workers who are new to the industry, that they will pick a gentleman who is a regular to the house, who's nice, young, attractive, you know, a really nice person, and then they basically won't charge on the house fee, but they'll tell him that you'll pick this person. Um, and it was fine. Um, I told him afterwards that he was uh, the second person I'd ever chosen to sleep with. Um, and afterwards I was sitting in the staff room, I was just sort of sitting on the side of the lounge, just like staring at the wall. And the other workers are like, are you all right? Like, did something happen, are you okay? And I'm like, no, I'm fine. I just, I felt like I would feel dirty or different or something. And I felt completely fine. So I worked the rest of the shift. And at the end of the night, um, they handed me 850 bucks that I'd made, which is more than I was making in a week at my normal day job. And asked me if I wanted to come back tomorrow. So yeah, I'll do that again. <laughs> <laughs> um. How would you say is the sort of main reason people go into this industry? Everyone's different. Um, I know so many workers that have all different sorts of reasons as to why they get into the industry. Um, there is, sure, there's a, there's a portion of people that, like I said, that you're not in maybe the best state, but it's not, like you wouldn't consider becoming a sex worker if you have a problem with having sex with people, because that would just be ridiculous. It's more that you're so afraid of the stigma that society has and what will your friends think, what will your family think, you know, will it change you? And I think that that's, is taking that step is the harder bit. Mm. Um, why do you think most clients come to the industry? The clients vary from person to person. Um, for some, it's that they want something that they can't get otherwise. They might have some, you know, more diverse interests that... Um, they're too afraid to ask their partners for whether they're in a long-term relationship or they've only had casual relationships or some things they don't feel comfortable asking someone because they expect they're going to be judged for wanting that. Um, but for probably the most of my clients, they want someone to be nice to them. Sure, I mean, I think for a lot of guys that it's not very manly to want to talk to someone or want someone to be nice to you, want someone to hug you, want someone to care for you. Um, so they, you know, they don't want to go see a shrink because that's not, you know, it's not a blokey thing. You don't go and talk about your problems. But if you go and talk to a girl who's naked and you're going to have sex as well possibly, then, you know, that makes it okay. Because it's about that. It's not about, you know, the rest of the talking. Though most of the time it's then is, you know, talking and hugging and just, you know, being nice to someone. Um, do you enjoy your work? Yeah. 
I think it's the best job in the world. Um, I think that my job's to make people happy. And there's, I've worked in various different industries and all sorts of jobs and nothing else is where you, your job is to directly affect how someone else feels. That I know that when I spend an hour or more with someone and I can see that they are you know, much happier, their mood's much better and you know, yeah, it makes such a difference to them. And I really like being able to do that for people. Um, dealing with the stigma of society is probably the main bit. Having to fight government and government agencies and stuff to be recognised for my, you know, my right to, my, to a legal profession. Um, to have to fight to have to be, have my opinions and thoughts on the industry respected and listened to. Um, directly day to day, dealing with idiots on the phone, which is, it, it's people who aren't people who are interested but want to ring up and have their view which still comes from the, the sort of point of stigma in society. Um, can you sort of describe a typical day for you working? Working? Um, well, it's a matter of like, I usually have my bookings ahead of time, like a day or two, sometimes weeks, months, it depends on the person. Um, often they're prepaid, so I won't have to worry about you know, dealing with the financial and that sort of stuff. I prefer to keep that separate to... For a lot of people, they do want a nice time, and I think it's better for them to not be reminded at every point that they're paying for my company. Like to have it like you know normal, nice and natural. I spend you know shower, shave, primp, hair, makeup, pick out clo the right clothing, pack my bag. Depends on if they have particular interests. I always ask that to make sure I take the right costumes or equipment. Um, yeah, and then spend time with them. And what that involves, that just varies from person to person. But a lot of it is talking, and then come back home and you know about playing video games and stuff again. Um, so you talked a little bit about society's view. Um, what do you think is the general view in society? The general view, it depends. There seems to be two camps to me, which is there's the people who think it's inherently wrong for some reason or another. Often that's not logical. Like, if you have some, someone has some problem with extramarital sex, like you shouldn't have sex before you're married, only ever have sex with the person you're married, I can see why you'd have a problem with it. But you should have a problem with everyone having casual sex altogether. But if you don't have that, if you are fine with people choosing to consent, like two adults consenting to have, or, or two or more adults choosing to consent, then, and you're fine with people working for money, which work is where you would do something you might not otherwise do because you're being paid, which is what pretty much every job is. I'm sure most people wouldn't go and stand for eight hours in a shop if they weren't being paid, just you know, purely for the joy of it. So if you don't have a problem with those two things, I don't see where mixing them becomes an issue for people. Um, then there's sort of the other camp, which I think are more reasonable people, which they may think, well, it's not something I'd want to do, but if you're happy, good luck to you. you know, if and that's a, I think that's, to me, is the better attitude. Is it's like you don't have to, I don't require someone to like what I do or want what I want to do, but you can if other people are happy doing what they do, just let them do it. Um, what do you think is the greatest misconception about people who work in the industry? Um, I think one of the greatest misconceptions is that the majority of sex workers are uneducated people, people who don't know what they're doing. Uh, just you know, driven by drug habits, or you know that they don't have. There's not skilled work, um, and that people sort of are, are focused on that. Um, there's this study that's actually coming out soon because I've seen the draft, um, and the like. The rate of drug use amongst the sex worker population is about the same as the general community. Like it's not any more common. Um, I think the other thing that people tend to think is that people still get hung off, hung on is the um, the idea of sex workers as vectors of disease. That people assume that because you have sex with lots of people, you must get STIs and pass them on and stuff. Whereas, like all the studies show that the percentage of STI infection in particularly New South Wales sex workers 
is about half of that, the general population. So, so statistically, a sex worker is half as likely to have an STI than any other, than a woman from the rest of the community. Um, how do you think this view can change that really negative kind of first count view? Um, well, I think it's education. And I think that media has a lot of responsibility for that. Um, that they're happy to jump on negative industry stories because they're more sensationalist, they sell more papers. Whereas the good stories, people aren't as interested in. So, I mean, more myth-busting sort of articles, I think, would be useful. Things that do really show, like when the studies come out, that, you know, that the lower rates of STI is like such a good sort of health response from like sex workers. Things that show more about like, just to generalise the sex workers and struggles um, and not always focus like, on the negative side, not to make up stuff. <laughs> um, there's, whenever there's like the council developments and stuff, like, people always throw up this big moral problem that going on with there's a sex worker working in the area, there'll be condoms everywhere and needles and you know, men will be wandering around you know, harassing everyone in the area and that's just not really the case, is that there's so many sex workers that people aren't even aware that they're near because sex workers are very discreet. It's, you know, it's a very important part of the industry and it doesn't impact on everyone else. And I think that whatever someone else is doing behind their closed door, like people should just leave them to it and stop judging. Yeah. Um, you said you um, had a lot of problems sort of legally getting representation and rights and having your voice heard. Can you just tell me a little bit more about that? Um, I do a lot of advocacy work. Um, so often when governments or other different groups are making decisions that will affect sex workers, they don't consult with sex workers. They don't, they'll consult with health, they'll consult with various different planning bodies and all sorts of people, but not sex workers, which for any other industry, you, if you are making decisions that will affect that industry, you consult with people who are in the industry, people who are recognised as knowing a lot about the industry. And we have a lot of peer-based organisations that are made up of sex workers. And often it's quite a battle to keep talking to people, to get to be at these tables, at these meetings, to be able to have our say and put our view out there, not having other people's often misguided views put upon us. Um, as an individual, I am out to pretty much everyone who I am not too afraid to be, which is a very limited sort of group that I'm afraid of mostly, I'm very out. I believe that there is a sort of, group think has a, is really powerful, that people get this view often from American media of what sex workers are, and then other people go, yeah, I've heard that too, and then that becomes the norm to think that. So I like to challenge individual people. When people ask what I do for work, I say I'm an escort. And then people go, oh, that's different. I'm like, why, it's a job, which, tends to make people immediately stop overreacting in the head and go, oh yeah. And then I'm happy to answer their questions, even though they will often ask the sort of standard, usual questions, which get a bit tedious. But um, in the hope that if I can like myth bust with that one person, that then at some point there might be an article and they might be at a barbecue and someone will say something, and that person will be like, well no, actually, I spoke to someone who's an escort the other day and be able to put forward like the views that I gave and have that more accepted because clearly that's, you know, more direct new information. And that I think if enough people sort of, you know, get that idea, then it will become more normal. Um, so what's your sort of view on brothels in comparison to private schools? Um, I think that, I mean, there's various different forms of sex work and people will choose whatever's going to suit them better. I mean, I started working in Brussels and changed to private. Um, and I prefer private now. I prefer to be at home when I'm not working, not sitting in a staff room. Um, I prefer the intense level of control and, well, fussiness I can sort of have of who I choose to deal with. And there's no matter, I mean, in a brothel, you still have full choices to which clients you choose to see. But when you do an intro, you don't know if it's going to be someone who's nice or someone who's not. Whereas 
you know, on the phone with my website, I don't tend to talk to people unless they are particularly looking for me, and I prefer that. Well, I, should add um, I think that brothels are a really valuable environment, um, especially for new workers, um, because you get a lot more peer support. You know, there's other people with you there, you know, mm -hmm. so there's other workers to help you, to help train you, you know, so that you can learn, you, you learn what to look for, like you're trained to look for STIs, you know, trained how to deal with different types of clients, different skills and equipment and all that sort of thing. So I think it really helps to build your confidence. Um, so for you specifically, how important was that support at the beginning? Um, it was great. I think it was something that did really help me come, like, because I, I stopped working after I paid off the debt. Um, but then I came back and a few times I sort of left, but it always was sort of drawn back. And I think that for me, the first experience in the first brothel that I worked in, it was great. I had never felt so accepted by other people. I find that sex workers are really open-minded, it's probably part of being a marginalised community, but not judged, you're accepted for who you are. And everyone's just cool with like, whoever you are, whatever you are, you know, everything's great. And we had a great time. If you weren't in a room with a client having fun, we like, played like Nintendo and had played poker. And it was just like, it was going to, like going to a party every night, but you came home with 800, 800 or more dollars. Well, I mean, problems with clients, same as any business, it'll always happen. You get people who make bookings who don't show up, which is always annoying. Um, people who just mess you around time-wise and stuff, you know, general crank cause. Um, face to face, no, I haven't really had any problem. I mean, I've had the odd occasion where I've gone against my gut instinct and there's been more than one person at the property when I've got there, which I've just left and gone back to my driver. So, you know, I haven't had to deal with too much issues. I mean, I probably had more issues when I was working in a brothel. That's just because on the Friday night, Saturday night shift, you get a lot of drunk clients, which they can be more difficult to handle. I don't think it's that they're bad people, but where most people would pick up if you're unhappy with something or you know, they're hurting you a bit because they're being too rough. When someone's drunk or high, they're, they're more impaired. So their ability to interpret what's happening is a lot poorer. Uh, but I found that, and you know, with the help of other people, is that if you can really get through to them, that's not okay, I don't like that. Which can, the drunker they are can be more difficult, but once they get that, then they're usually really quite apologetic. But sometimes getting through to that can be a bit can be a bit more challenging. Yeah. Um, if you could say something to sort of the people, just general general public about about you and what you do, what would it be? It's a bit profound, isn't it? <laughs> um, just don't judge me. You know, I'm a consenting adult. The people I see are consenting adults. Just let people do what they want. That's not really impacting you. Don't imagine all these things that don't exist. Just, you know, let me get on with my life. Stop making it hard. Is there anything else you'd, you'd like to add? Um, when I was talking about stigma, I think that there is a lot more stigma for clients than there is even for sex workers. I think that sex workers collectively we've been fighting the stigma and we try and get the good media stories out. But for clients that they don't have a financial interest in that. But that's where people come with models where they demonise clients. And I think that this is almost this view that people seem to put across when they like read comments on newspaper articles and stuff, is that people seem to think that like sex workers and clients are a whole separate section of society. And people really forget, it's like, it is just general people in your community. You know, it's the people who live, live down the streets, you know, mums, dads, it's, it's all sorts of just normal people. <laughs> it's not this whole sort of separate section of the seedy underclass that, I don't know where people think that these people are the rest of the time. And I think, too, I mean, for the majority of the sex industry, it's not a cheap hobby. <laughs> so these people, 
you know, clients need to be, you know, fairly well employed to sort of, you know, be able to take part in that sort of service. And, you know, it's generally successful people in society who can afford that. Uh, it's just decent, normal people. They're not seedy. They're not weird. They're just people who just want someone to be nice to them. And I think that because people don't see who clients are, because often they might have families or friends and they're more afraid of being judged, that they won't come forward. And I think that's when people come up with legal models where they go, oh, sex workers are victims, because that's what they automatically think, even though I am very happily you know, autonomous in choosing what I want to do. And that's where they have like the Swedish model where they want to like criminalise clients, which doesn't work either because then it still forces the sex workers underground. And yeah, I don't know what else to say, mate. <laughs> um, would you change any legislation or anything? I don't know how thorough your knowledge is. Would I change it? I'd make it a little bit better, but I wouldn't change it much. Not New South Wales. New South Wales is decriminalised, as is New Zealand. And as far as sort of example models that are held up around the world, New South Wales is right up there. Decriminalisation has been great. Um, the health outcomes for sex workers, like in terms of STI uh, um, rates, is so low. It's like the lowest of any group in the world. <coughs> it's through... Being decriminalised, it's open, it's easier for people to get outreach services, to be open, to get educated, to learn about, you know, how to use condoms and all the different sorts of protection correctly, all the different methods you can use. Like, it's simple things that people don't realise is that if you're having sex with someone, you have one hand for yourself and one hand for them. Because if you put your hand on someone's genitals, and then put a condom on, and then put that hand back on top of the condom. You might as well have really not use the condom for most of it because you've just put the fluids on the outside. You know, it's simple things like that that sex workers know that the rest of the population really doesn't, and maybe they should. Um, there is, there is, the Liberal government, state government, proposed um, before they were elected that they were going to make changes to move towards legalisation of the industry. The difference between legalisation and decriminalisation is that decriminalisation, all the criminal offences associated with sex work are removed. Nothing's criminal. Legalisation is where there are different rules imposed around certain sorts of sex work or how it can operate or you have to have licensing. And you know, they're looking at bringing a licensing model. The problem with licensing is that it makes the industry two-tiered. You don't have the people who can comply with the licensing, which can be very restrictive, and the people who can't, who are then criminalised again, which then completely... It's a step backwards because these people then, you have to... You know, if you're criminalised, people have to be underground. So it's very hard to get outreach services, to education services. You know, to dis they just disappear. The problem with licensing is that and there has been exam plenty of examples of that it opens up things to corruption, which can go both ways. If you don't have a license and you're operating, if it's criminalised, you can be open to corruption from the police. And the whole reason that decriminalisation was brought in from New South Wales was because of the Wood Royal Commission, because so many police officers were basically demanding free sexual services or money from sex workers in order to turn the blind eye. So when you're not breaking the law, it took away that power. But if you have various different licensing and stuff, I mean, then it gives that power back to someone. Even with the, in New South Wales, there was corruption around Parramatta through where council officers, a council officer was basically visiting brothels that didn't have a DA. So it's not illegal. It's no more illegal than having a fish and chip shop where it's supposed to be a hairdresser's because it's not the same, it's not the right DA. Um, and basically demanding to get free services in order to, to allow the business to continue to run. So whenever you go in and are more restrictive with the industry, it just, you know, it opens it up to a world of problems and it just really further er erodes like sex workers' human rights. So I think that 
I mean, people will accept, like, it doesn't matter what you do, you can make the industry legal, license, whatever, it doesn't get rid of the industry, it's here to stay. You know, the world's oldest profession and all that, it's like, it will always be around. So you need to make sure that it's, you know, the best situation for everyone. And decriminalisation, from all the research, is clearly that. Um, I just have one more question for you. Um, how do you feel about, like, outreach programs? Do you think they're effective, or...? I think peer-based outreach is fantastic. And that's all outreach needs to be peer-based. Um, or it's really not effective. Um, peer-based outreach is where, like SWAP in New South Wales does that. It's where someone who is a sex worker or has had sex work experience firsthand will basically go out, you know, provide information. It can be information about your legal rights. It can be... Um, get various information about how to keep yourself safe, information about how to use condoms, information about testing centres, give out free condoms, you know. They do courses on various different sorts of things like self-defence and lots of stuff. Oh, first aid, they've got a first aid course coming up soon as well. And I think that's great. When people try and do outreach, see, and that outreach is done from the point of view where sex work is fine, with, you know, <clears throat> helping to make sure that you have everything you need, that you've got a great situation to make sure that you know, everyone's educated because that's why we had such a great health response in New South Wales is because everyone knows how to protect themselves and know how to use the equipment correctly. You know why to use it. So people can make informed decisions. When it doesn't work is when it's outreach from people who have a particular intention and that intention isn't just to support sex workers. It's groups that want to just provide exit strategies, which are basically go and talk to workers and just try and tell them that what they're doing is entirely wrong and damaging and awful and we can help you get out of this and, you know, and that's just condescending and <laughs> it's really just unpleasant. Um, there's groups who do that and then basically they offer sex workers instead jobs in a noodle bar that they run and own. So sex workers basically go from making $100 an hour to making minimum wage working in a little, little noodle bar. Um, there's various groups that they seek to s outreach from non-sex workers or even s there are some sex workers who have, you know, decide they don't longer like the industry, who have the intention of trying to basically talk sex workers out of what they're doing. That's, it, that's not any good. Like, I think if someone wants to be out of the industry, that that should be their choice and by all means if they want support yeah, I'll do that, that's great. But I don't think that's a, sort of a decision that should be sort of pushed onto people to go, well, maybe you should think about doing something else. The whole sort of thing is, oh, when were you going to get, like, a, have you had a normal job? Like, and that's just ridiculous. Well, thanks. I think, um, 